everybody, this is A7X fan Ben, and this is Pirate CSG podcast episode number 42. And I want to thank the newest guest on the podcast, which is game designer Mike Salinker. How are you tonight? I'm fine. 42 episodes. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it started in like late summer 2017 with God Mason and then eventually Xerix. And yeah, we've just kept going for a while now. So very exciting. Fantastic. Well, I'm happy to be on Awesome. Yeah, totally happy to talk about this game. You'll yeah. you'll be surprised that this is my first uh, podcast about Pirates of Spanish Main in some time. Yeah, I think I did hear one of the ones from a while back, or at least part of it. So yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I'm excited. I I did a, a big review of all the files from like 2003 uh, before I before I got on the call. Uh-huh. So I remember things that I have uh, I had long forgotten. Okay, so awesome. So hopefully we'll get this one. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Nice. Yeah, it's crazy to me to think about how long it's been because last year we passed 10 years since the game went out of print in November 2008. So now it's been over a decade since it was in print. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah. Uh, But, you know, a lot of people still have their ships, and they use them, uh, like, not just in Pirates, but in all other games, too. So, uh, I've certainly been over to people's houses where they just have rows and rows of ships up on a mantle or something. Yep. Awesome. That's really awesome. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I'm in the community, Pirate CSG community online pretty much every day, and people on Facebook are posting about ships they bought and their old collections that they dug up and things like that. So, there's still there's still definitely some passion and love for the game um, throughout not just the States, but sometimes I hear about people in other countries, somebody um, in Poland or somewhere in Europe was talking about buying packs recently. And I've personally played with the, on the Vassal module, I've played virtually with someone in Singapore. So it's pretty awesome. I love how uh, it's, uh, it's, good to hear. <laughs> it's good to hear there's life with an old girl yet. Oh yeah, exactly. All right, so we'll get to the questions here. Um, so the first one was, what was your involvement with Wits Kids like? Uh, it was uh, uh, <laughs> exhilarating, is the best <laughs> way to phrase it. Nice. So um, uh, maybe a little uh, chronology might help people understand. So um, I was the I was uh, uh, in the R and D department. I was one of the creative directors at Wizards of the Coast uh, from. 1995 to uh, 2003, um, and uh, I met you know uh, I met a bunch of people during that time. I was uh, I met James Ernest obviously, who has a significant role in this story, but I also met Jordan Weissman, uh, who was running a company called FASA at the time in my hometown, well, in my then hometown of Chicago, and uh, we uh, worked together on BattleTech quite a bit uh, on uh, storytelling that we were doing. I wrote some stories. I made some interactive games, all that. Uh, and then Jordan moved out to Seattle, where I was, uh, and uh, uh, started WizKids and, um, while I was still at Wizards. And then I left Wizards uh, on October 17th, 2003, and on October 26th, 2003, I got asked to work on Pirates of the Spanish Main. So it was really, literally the very first thing I did after leaving the company I was at for eight years. Nice. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. You've got the exact dates and everything. So October 03. I know. Nice. Yeah, I know exactly. I know exactly how it went down. Um, there was a lot of gnashing of teeth over it, over the timing. But uh, yeah, it was the first thing I worked on. Uh, James had already done a design of a game called um, or called Armada del Oro, mm-hmm. which was the name of the game at the time. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, Armada del Oro was uh, a game of, that has essentially the rules of Pirates of the Spanish Main, a couple of minor differences uh, after you know I got involved. But fundamentally, uh, the game was you know you take these long ships of long 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 and short edges of cards and measure length between what were then ships made out of legos yeah uh the santa maria was the first ship created for pirates of the spanish main and it was a red and white lego ship and it was gorgeous uh, because everything james makes is gorgeous and um 
And the game was, you know, uh, a Lego game for a long time. Uh, and uh, then it became a polystyrene game. Um, and the chronology on that is also very interesting, in my opinion, because um, two years earlier, a friend of mine named Dan Verson uh, was working on a game which he produced in 2002 called Z Cards. Yep. Uh, Z Cards was a polystyrene pop out uh, game with like dinosaurs and fighter jets and whatever else they could think of. Um, it's a very, very simple game. And at Wizards, I had been attracted to Z cards. I wanted to make a game out of them, but got nowhere with that. And so uh, when I left Wizards, I was like, well, I'm never going to work on a Z cards game. And sure enough, seven days later, I got asked to work on a polystyrene pop out game uh, called Fire, called, called, called Armada del Oro. And I was like, this is, this is pretty good. Um, I get to do something that I was not able to ever do at Wizards. I certainly didn't get, I certainly never told anybody about outside of Wizards about my interest in Z cards, but it was very exciting to, to get to work on that. And, uh, so I, I came in there and I just hit the round running and, uh, it went from being, a game that was a set of rules to a game with a fully developed set of cards uh, in 30 days. Wow. That's very quick. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I did so find it. By I November. Did... No, you go. So. Go ahead. Yeah, no, in I just November, find it fascinating I... that uh, James Ernest it started with Lego, and, and we saw the picture of uh, his original Lego ship on his site for Kegway Bay. I do find that really yeah. cool. <laughs> It works well as a model. Yeah, Santa Maria was a great change. I mean, James and I made a lot of games out of Legos. Um, the a lot of people have never seen the uh, prototype of uh, Lords of Vegas, but Lords of Vegas was also made out of Legos. Hmm. Um, uh, we made all of Las Vegas out of Lego parts, and then put dice in into the uh, you know parts to make the to make the game. Uh, great. So, um, but yeah, uh, you know, it was a really good, fun game and it needed somebody to complicate it. Mm -hmm. And that was my job. Okay. Interesting. Um, cause I was always, so James, James had worked on some trading card games. He designed, uh, Looney Tunes, for example, a uh, trading card game. Um, but he hadn't done the level of, you know, card design and, in the trading card game form that I had done. And so that was my, skill set and so i just came in there and i wrote um let's see what would that be i wrote uh 300 cards wow in a month wow um yeah that's 10 a day uh so that was that was, yeah so that like i said that was the answer to your question is exhilarating because it was <laughs> real quick it went from Hey, would you be interested to? I better be done super fast. Okay, wow. Um, nice. <laughs> that is really crazy. Yeah. Um, cool. So uh, yeah, I've I've noticed that. Um, so I kept track of uh, the the spreadsheets, and I noticed that I was on spreadsheet number eight. Um, um which meant we went through seven iterations of the game where we were rapid prototyping it based on all of the changes that I was making. And I guess that James was making probably too, um, in that, in that period of time. So that is incredibly quick. That, that never happens in game design where you make stuff that quickly. And we just, we just cranked it out. We just kept changing it and making it better. Nice. Yeah. I was about to say cranking it out. That's for sure. So would you say you had more yeah. um, experience with the design of the actual game pieces than James Ernest did, who was more in, with the original From rules? The view of, like, my skill set was, okay, so you've got a game. That's great. Super. Now you need hundreds of exemplars of things that can happen with that game set. And it was my job to generate all of those. So I did... I mean, James obviously did a ton, so I don't want to take away from anything that he did. But what I what I remember, what I what I did uh, is that I just wrote 
all of the possible ships I could think of. And then uh, James had a spreadsheet uh, which had um, – but he had originally had named all the ships ridiculously. So there was the El Absurdo was one of the Spanish ships and stuff like that. So obviously he wasn't, I mean, like, I don't know if he actually wanted that set to go forward um, or not, but it wasn't going to go forward. Yeah. <laughs> the ships weren't going to be named, named after terrible things that happened to them. You know? <laughs> so, so, uh, so um, I came in and I named all of the ships and all the captains and crews and all that. And uh, I don't know how, I mean, there, there was later steps where Ethan Pasternak and Mike Mulvihill and J Jordan himself, contributed and they overrode a bunch of it and so forth. Um, but here's the part you may not be aware of. I don't know if James brought it up. Uh, maybe he did. Um, I wrote, uh, so you're familiar with the uh, English ships and the Spanish ships and the pirate ships. Yeah. Uh, from, from the first set. Mm -hmm. What you don't have is the Dutch set I also wrote. Yep. I wish we did. And, yeah, I wrote an entire armada of Dutch ships, um, which is actually, in my opinion, some of the best stuff in that version of the game. Uh, the significant element of all the Dutch ships, though, that I think sort of led to it being cut is they all had names like De Slagsvard and the and De Dordrecht and De yep. Gelderland. Who could keep that straight? Right, like, like, who could actually remember which ship was the Hakbiel and which which ship was the the Thorbeck? Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> right, it's funny because yeah, I've had so so <laughs> I've had like the exact same experience because I actually I'm uh, kind of permanently designing a historical set called Pirates of the Age of Sail, and I have a Dutch faction, of course. And I've had the same experience where I don't know how to pronounce the ship names, but there's a ton of them. Exactly. I, I know I've yeah. created like already like a hundred historically accurate Dutch ships or something like that. So I totally understand what that's like. <laughs> the, the Dutch ships were my favorites and they, they did some great things. They were, they were fast and they, they, um, they did all sorts of clever stuff. And, and some of their, some of their stuff got incorporated when they, when they cut the Dutch faction they took a lot of the ships and repurposed them as spanish ships or english ships so, so many of them survived but hmm. but what got lost was this army that was just super fast okay um i mean the 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 ships just moved around all over the place and they got shot to hell all the time hmm. um but they had some great characters there was a guy named admiral rolf um, and Admiral Rolf's flavor text was, should there be peace, Admiral Wolf will find a way to end it. Uh, you know, and, and, uh, you know, they, um, uh, they, they, they were just a really fun faction and they did not make it, uh, yeah. to the, to the, uh, water as it were. Yep. Yeah. It's too bad. Cause the Dutch were such a huge factor in the, in the real age of sail. I like how historical the game yeah. was and how historical it started. I was really happy about that. Yeah, I mean, I would say it got a little more cartoony as the yeah. game <laughs> development went on, but that's fine, right? Like, like I, I mean, I really tried hard to make something that, um, and, and a lot of it survived, but not all of it. I tried to make something where everything about it was interconnected. Mm -hmm. Like, the Spanish ships referred to the English captains and the Dutch forts repeatedly over the course of the flavor text right and yeah. so there was just so much back and forth because you would understand that this environment was just essentially people shooting at each other mm -hmm. right so of course they would get to know each other pretty well yeah and uh so the guns that is g-u-n-n-s uh had their sort of uh approach to the world and uh, even inside that faction, Bro Brother Virgil was a very different kind of character, and his ships were different. And and uh, uh, and then um, you know uh, you know all all there was a lot more. I think in the version I wrote that had 
this sort of deep interconnectedness, which in all honesty probably would have been missed uh, by most people, right? But uh, what survived actually I really like. Like the, yeah. the end result was great. Yeah, no, I love the flavor text. And I, I've noticed that sometimes the Spanish main flavor text is longer than some of the other sets, which I like because it really, it is fun to delve into the game's lore. Not everybody will, but when you do, it kind of brings more meaning to the games you play when you can kind of create scenarios or kind of have like some kind of pseudo historical context to the game you're playing. I think it makes it more enjoyable. So I like that a lot. Yeah, I had fun, you know, like I'd, I'd create characters like the Calico Cat and <laughs> and stuff like that and, and just sort of imagine where they were in that period of time. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that was, I, I don't know what it was like after that point, but but I mean, let's just say that the base set got a lot more time uh, to have that stuff kicked around, yeah. I think, than, yeah, than some makes, of the other sets. That does make a lot of sense, yeah. Yeah, some people have talked about how they arguably kind of rushed some of the expansions. They did like 13 sets in like four or five years, so it was a lot. I know. Yeah. I, I Look, um, I am not one of those people because I got to check every time they made an expansion. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. With that schedule of releases. Yeah. I thought it was great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is nice. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Too bad now, it eventually went places and never... Yeah, I never thought it would. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, it's all right. Um, you probably wish uh, Return to Savage Shores came out because there was an unreleased set that was designed, but then it was shut, and WizKids got shut down right before it would have gone to the printers, basically. So, <laughs> oh, well. Sure. Um, yeah. I don't think I can get greedy on that. That, yeah, was, yeah. A, that <laughs> yeah. was a game that I thought would be like a, 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 you know, a nice little thing. First thing I did after I came out of Wizards, you know, and it would have a nice set and maybe it'd get an expansion or two. I never had, like, this thing has 15 expansions mm -hmm. in the pool. Yeah, I didn't have any idea that was going to happen. So I was very delighted about the reaction that people had. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, and that kind of jives with some of the one of the later questions and some of the thoughts people have had about it kind of started as, like, beer and pretzels game. But then as they added more rules and stats, it got way more complicated than anybody could have anticipated, really. So but I like that. So yeah, made it more of a I think game. it's I think. Yeah, I think that's about who worked on it in a large way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, it left to his own devices. James would probably not complicate a game like that. But when you bring in a, a person like Mike Mulvihill, who's just a fantastic game designer and just, you know, no, you know, it's designed something like, um, you know, a hundred percent of all of the battle mechs that have ever been created. The game is going to get rich real yeah. fast. And, uh, so yeah, he, he and Ethan and, and those guys just dived in and started making, taking it in directions that I would never have thought it could go. Nice. Yeah. That's good to know. Uh, the next question did you have a good or bad feeling about what WizKids was going to do with the game that you and James Ernest designed, like, once you left WizKids, basically? I see. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I obviously uh, have known these guys for a very long time. We've been friends now for 25 years. Okay. And so... Um, I just always have a good feeling about stuff like that. Um, I think it was way more successful than I thought it would be, but I knew it was in good hands. Um, and so I felt really good about what was going to happen. Um, I don't think I, you know, like I didn't think it would have sea monsters in it, but sure. Why not? You know, that's yeah. great. Uh, and so, um, I, yeah, I, I just sort of knew that um, whatever would happen would probably be really good. Uh, and of course, you know, I mean, you can sort of say what you want about my skills or James's skills or, you know, Jordan, even Jordan Weissman's legendary game designer. But the real star of this game design process was the people who had to engineer the 24 foot long sh uh, ship. Uh, printing files, right? I mean, like, it was all about the beautiful graphic design and the construction on the game. And, you know, we added... I mean, it wouldn't be a good game without James. It wouldn't be a complete game without me. You know, all that. But, mm -hmm. but 
I mean, the real star of this game is how gorgeous and fun the ships are to play with. Mm -hmm. And that's all about some really hard work that was done on the man on the artistic side and on the uh, manufacturing side. Yeah. Yeah. That corresponds to what we said earlier about how people love how the ships look, even in some people have said they don't like the game as much as how the ships look. And some people use them yeah. for a lot of other games, not just pirates. So sometimes multiple other games, naval games and whatnot. So that is a good point. <laughs> All right, and then the next question uh, kind of gets into what we were talking about. What other designers and artists did you work with? So other than Jordan, Ethan, um, I don't know if you ever worked with Tiffany O'Brien or um, yeah. Kelly Bonia. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I, I mostly worked directly, well, obviously, I mostly worked directly with James, obviously, but, um, but I uh, spent a lot of time in discussions with Ethan about what we were trying to do. Um, but eventually I think the, the important thing is that once they got it, once the, the game made sense to whiz kids and, you know, they got how I was putting together ships and I, you know, I essentially taught them the mechanics of how to build ships. Um, they just took it from there and I, they did a great job. Uh, I didn't have to ever go back and say, no, 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 you don't understand how this is done. Um, you know, listen to me, I'm a very talented game designer. That conversation never happened because they just got it right out of the gate. And so when it came time to make a new set, you know, there was a discussion maybe about like art, on an artistic level, what are we trying to accomplish here? But beyond that, they didn't really need my help. That's really cool. I like hearing that. Good, uh, good people over there. They did, they did excellent work. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it really shows in the set quality. Yeah, yeah it was an awesome game. Um, do you have any knowledge on how WizKids made the ships and where they were made? Yeah. Well, where is, I can't really talk about because um, okay. I didn't go there. Yeah. Um, but uh, I absolutely do. I mean, these, these things... I mean, you don't understand until you see one, you know, actually, I should say, just see pictures of it. I never saw one up close. But like I said, these these press sheets are 24 feet long. Mm -hmm. um, that That is an amazing thought on its own, yeah. right? That, to, they, that just making something that size. Uh, and then what I don't think people maybe understand is they think, okay, uh, what you need to do is... Uh, you, you you got your little die for it, and uh, then then a machine comes along and cuts, you know, sort of makes an indentation in the plastic and the polystyrene to around the shape of the thing that's supposed to be punched out. You know, sort of like what you can imagine, you know, a record needle going into a record, right? Um, that's not how it's done at all. A giant machine comes and just. Uh, comes down on it with a thousand pounds of force yep. uh, and breaks it. Huh. Like everything you see, all that punching out and so forth, that is the plastic being broken by this machine. Um, it's incredibly uh, forceful yeah. and, uh, and incredibly precise. And so uh, basically um, it's essentially, you know, punching out the cards for you. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh punching other ships for you, except it doesn't go all the way. It doesn't do that job. That's your job. Yeah. Your job is to finish it. Its job is to start it. But yeah. It's a, it's a, it's an amazing, uh, uh, amazing process how it's made. Yeah. That does sound really cool. Yeah. A lot of people have kind of theorized on how to bring the game back or even just how to make their own like personal custom set. But a lot of times it gets bogged down, um, in like in terms of production. No yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like you'd yeah. have to make so many sets <laughs> to even come close to breaking even. And like most people, um, no, that's not a thing. Here's how you do that. Okay. I'm <laughs> going to explain how you do that. Yeah. All right. What you do is you buy a lot of sets of pirates of the Spanish main yep. and you get really good at painting. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And sand, you can sand on them off. Top stuff of like the, that. Yeah, exactly. You paint on top of the ship that is already there. Yeah. That's the only way to do it. Yep. Like there are things that in this process that I don't think anybody's ever seen had ever seen before. You know, Z cards was um 
was cool, but what it didn't have that pirates had was curved pieces. Yep. Right. I mean, like pieces that held together when they were curved, and basically the the continued strength of the piece um, of of the ship was was the pressure caused by the ship's uh, sides being bent. Um, to to hold the ship together, right? Uh, and that was a huge innovation the, um, that allowed things to feel like, you know, the things that were in Z cards uh, were very boxy, right? Yeah. They could make tanks, for example. Tanks are fundamentally boxes, yeah. you know, uh, with a pointy bit on them, right? So, uh, but these had to be sleek. They had to look like they could float through the water. Yeah. And so um, that kind of construction is super hard to make happen. Uh, even if you could somehow get a, fi- a manufacturing facility to make you a whole bunch of polystyrene and then you broke it, you still couldn't get it to do that. Yeah, especially yeah. given how it's- many different ship types there were. Because like, even in the first set, yeah. there were a lot of different ship types, and then they just kept adding more and more almost every set. So you'd have to determine right. we you know, originally hull strength and like curvature for each type to make sure each one was durable, let alone just one of them. We originally turned over uh, eight eight builds. Yep. Um, so there were eight sets of what would make a ship. Uh, and we thought that was more than they would accept. Uh-huh. Um, and they made all eight of those, and then they made dozens more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is really fascinating. It gives me more appreciation too towards like the game itself and how it's made and even just the kind of the intrinsic value of the pieces themselves too, regardless of what they're selling for. So that's really great to yeah. hear about. So I understand. Yeah, it bit. was I mean it was just a really cool thing to be involved with because I remember at Wizards, you know, looking at Z cards and you know you know, I mean, Dan's a great game designer, but the game itself wasn't particularly stellar. And the pieces were kind of just okay. I mean, a, a dinosaur in Z cards was a uh, a single body piece with two crossing leg pieces. Mm-hmm. Right? So it was essentially, you know, three pieces uh, in the shape of, you know, like uh, one of them sawhorses from woodshop class. Yeah. Right. That's not very exciting. Right. That's not a thing that, you know, when I say, oh, cool, I got a game with dinosaurs. I don't really want that. I I would rather have, you know, three dimensional pieces. WizKids went all the way and said, we want these to look like boats. You know, we want them to feel like boats. What do we have to do to do that? And uh, I think they nailed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they definitely did. I love the models and I love the scale of the game too because it lets you play even on a reasonably decent sized table you can play a game with like dozens of ships you're not constrained to like a one versus one battle like in some other games where the ships are too big to have like a large you know sea battle with fleets so yeah that's that's James Ernest right there yep yeah we you talked know, about James it. right James is the person who figures out how to do the most with the least amount of stuff. Mm-hmm. That's his that's his uh, through line through his whole career, whether it's the cheap ass line and kill Dr. Lucky and things like that, all the way to tack, which is, you know, just very simple sets of I think there's three different uh, pieces in the whole game, mm-hmm. right? And uh, and that's just James, right? He just makes games like that. My approach is somewhat different, which is why I say I'm the developer on this game and not the designer on the game. Because, um, uh, although I'm listed under game designer, but whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, the The point being, uh, if I were in charge of this game, it would take over three kitchen tables. <laughs> nice. Right? Because because that's the kind of game I make. My games... My games fit on shelves you know my games don't fit on shelves they take up shelves yeah right and so i went uh, there's a store famous story now uh where i went to a store uh that we have out here in seattle called uh, card kingdom and one of the employees was sorting magic cards under a rack of my pathfinder adventure card game sets 
And these are like things that are 16 inches long by 12 inches and they're, you know, five inches tall. And they were all over his head. Uh, and they weigh about, you know, six pounds each. And I said, uh, Hey, uh, have those ever fallen on you? And he said, Oh yeah, all the time. And I was like, Oh God, this is how I'm going to jail. <laughs> right. <laughs> because, because I make games that fall over and hurt people. Oh my and so, so it was so cool transitioning out of what I was doing for wizards, which was, you know, making games like Axis and allies revised and betrayal at house on the hill and things like that you know, um, Risk Godstorm, which are all big, colossal games, to a game that really fit in your pocket. You know, you could show up with a booster pack and play. Yeah. And I thought that was great. It, it was super fun. I mean, obviously, I worked on games that were also booster pack-based at Wizards, but they were just card games. This was a board game, essentially, an ar- a, you know, an army game that you could just show up with an army in, rolled up in your uh, sleeve like a, a greaser cigarette case it was amazing yeah yeah i love how portable it can be too especially because you can you can punch the ships back into the cards and then you can travel with them more easily and they don't take yeah, space. that's yeah. that's the other great innovation that no one ever talks about yeah uh, that whiz kids brought to it so the old system you know if you popped a z cards out it was out it was gonna stay out <laughs> forever yeah. and they went back in and said no 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 no. this is really important to us we want to make it so that the cards can the ships can go back in and everybody went what why <laughs> would you want that and they were like look this is important for and they figured it out it was great yeah that is really cool yeah i know wolf punches his cards back in it's also good for trading too or reselling stuff when you want to punch them back in to, to ship them, things like that, save money on shipping. So it is cool and kind of preserve them a little bit more. Um, I know I understand if this one is totally classified, but do you happen to know the factory location or the company name of the, you know, the company in China that was printing the cards and producing them? No. Okay. Yep. <laughs> yeah, no, that's all that's good. That's an easy answer, easy answer to a question. And I can't imagine they're still doing it the, yeah, today, no. so yeah, what no, would no, it matter? No. Yeah, no, the dyes are probably long gone, to say the least. But Yeah, um, no, there's no way you keep those. Yeah, exactly. Uh, did you have any input into the collectible aspects of the game, like in terms of rarities and things like that, and distribution or collation methods? Oh, yeah, it's all in my spreadsheets. Mm-hmm. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah, it's all there. Um, everything I so there's a page um, in uh, so I'm actually looking at my spreadsheets now. Um, so there's a page on it where I essentially explain uh, where all the cuts are on the spreadsheet or I mean on the press sheet uh, that says how many versions of each of those ships exist. Okay, so there's 154. I don't know if this actually was the final. This is what I turned over. Uh, there's 154 total game elements. And when I talk about an element, what I mean is a special cut th- uh, that produces either a whole ship, a whole fort, a crew, or part of a ship that is spread out over multiple cards. Okay? So that all makes sense. Mm-hmm. So I did, uh, there's 154 of those. Uh, and then I built the frequency, which basically said, uh, here's the ratio, um, which uh, at the time, this probably didn't wasn't the final, but it was close. I don't know. was 8 to 5 to 3 for common, uncommon, and rare. Um, that made for 1,152 total cards. Mm-hmm. Now, was that 1,152 totally different cards? No, because... Cards appeared, ships appeared in multiple places on the press sheet, yep. right? So, but I had to explain to them, this goes here. This is how this all comes together. Uh, and there's a, the next phrase, the next page is just called how to read because it <laughs> just has to explain all of this stuff that I just told you in great detail <laughs> because it just like, like there's no way a human could understand it. Okay. Right? I didn't understand it. I, like I, I couldn't wow. like without the spreadsheet, I couldn't articulate it to you. Yeah. Right. So it has sentences like, you know, these numbers are all derived. Do not type here. 
on it, <laughs> right? <laughs> because you could type there and it would cause all the numbers to, to blow apart all over yeah. the spreadsheet, right? Oh. Uh, and so, you know, I mean, it was uh, it was necessary for me to build all this out because otherwise the whole thing would just collapse. Yeah. Right, it had all of its methods of calculating value, and that meant the number of points it was worth, and that meant how often we wanted it to appear. If that was more than the average value for that particular uh, type of ship, it had to say that this made that rarer, so this goes in the rare column, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? I mean, like, like it was it was very complicated, and I think they they sort of wanted me to do that because they knew that. You know, at Wizards, uh, I had to do that for lots of trading card games. But uh, this was not just a trading card game. I mean, it was much more complicated than any other game that I had ever worked on in that regard because it wasn't, you weren't producing one element per card. Yeah. Like sometimes there were like six elements on a card. <laughs> yeah. And we needed to know how many of those we were making, right? Uh, and I remember one of the great arguments. There, there's there weren't very many arguments on this game, but the uh, the one I remember clearest was the argument over whether each booster pack would have a die in it. Oh yes, <laughs> because because I said, let me tell you how many dice that is, <laughs> and I I showed how many cards, how many packs were necessary to gain a complete set of cards, and said. I believe, I don't remember exactly what this number was, but I'll just make it up. Uh, I believe, and I said, do you know anybody who wants 700 dice of the same <laughs> tiny size? Because that's the number you're requiring them to get. Yeah. And, uh, and they were like, but but they're free. They're just part of the thing. I was like, yeah, but, <laughs> but, but how many dice do you really want? Right. I mean, like, how many is there a point at which you start saying, I don't want any more packs because, for God's sake, I don't want my cat to swallow any more dice? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, I so, told, anyway, I, it was a, it, yeah. I told James Ernest I have like a whole little tin of them. And somebody, I don't know if you heard it on the other podcast, somebody a while back, Jack Moore was actually going to try to make one of the big 10 mastered ships just out of mini dice because they had so many of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could. I don't know if it would float, but whatever. Bring yeah, it on. I know. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. Yes, I mean it is a lot. You certainly could build a shirt, certainly a large number of forts out of them. That's <laughs> so, a good idea. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I. So anyway, I, as as is obvious, I lost that argument. Yeah. <laughs> oh well. I know. I do find that fascinating. <laughs> it's okay. And you can kind of when you feel the pack too, you can kind of like feel for the die and then you, you feel it and it's like, Oh, there's another one. Here I go again. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like yeah. another aspect yeah. of the whole collectible element. Like the game is super collectible in general, like everything. Like I keep the pack inserts and the little tiny dice and stuff like that. So it's so many things to keep track of, but it's, I think it's part of the fun <laughs> though, especially for someone like me that likes collecting yeah. games in general. So yeah, you got to remember there, there was no blueprint on how to make this kind of game. Like I think we might've made, like if this was the tenth game in of this particular type, you know, you could imagine we might have made a bunch of different decisions. But I'm real happy with the ones that got made because they're ridiculous and fun. Yep. Uh, and I can say I was there when that happened. Yep. <laughs> oh, that is great. <laughs> um, and then another question: going back to the the spreadsheets you have, actually, do you still have the Dutch faction, like your original plans for the Dutch? Oh yeah. Okay. Cool. I have everything. Nice. Is that I have something? everything? I I don't know. If, yeah. I don't know that it would be okay for me to release them. Oh, okay, but, that's, uh, that's what I was going to ask, though. Yeah, uh, that would be. Amazing I, I certainly couldn't make that decision on my own. Okay, but uh, yeah, fair point. but yeah, no, it's I have I have uh, yeah I have everything. I I have all the builds and you know all where it went from you know uh, uh, from our original design to how it got to the way it, it turned out to be. You know what I don't have, though? And you can probably help with this. I don't think I have a spreadsheet or I don't have a database or anything of what all of the text on all of the cards that made it out is. Does that exist? Yeah. 
Are you talking about flavor text or ability text or both? We do just have... everything. Like what what does yeah. exist out there? Yeah, yeah. Basically, uh, miniaturetrading.com has been like the main source of pirate CSG for a long time. Um, there was kind of a little scare, if you will, last year where it looked like the site was going to go down. It's still up, so you can still see the database there. But because of that little issue, um, like last fall, I actually converted that database into a master spreadsheet um, that does have all the game pieces with flavor text. And I got help from uh, Kyle Wolfel, the rules arbitrator, to fill out some of the flavor text. So there is a master spreadsheet out there. And at this point, it also includes um, Return to Savage Shores, the final set that didn't get released. And then also, there's some unreleased stuff that I found in the spreadsheets that Wolf sent me that's really interesting. So. So yeah, it is. I would like that. Uh, yeah, I can grab a, I can grab a link and uh, send it to you right now. So yeah, That's so it. yeah, I have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would love to see that because I think there's a point at which uh, I don't really know what point that was, where I absolutely lost either track of or interest in the what happened in the production process, and I don't, I don't know what that was, but I definitely did not. Uh, although I'm sure I approved the final set, um, I did not come away with like, this is the final version here. It is in spreadsheet form. Cause I think it actually stopped being in spreadsheet form, uh, at some point and just existed as a series of illustrator files or whatever they were. Interesting. And change changes were being made to those files without, you know, uh, continually updating the files that I was keeping. So quite honestly, I, your knowledge of what the final version of Pirates of the Spanish Main is, is way better than mine because I have eight other versions of it. Yeah. I know. I, I find that really fascinating. Cause like, I know cause sometimes the fans of the game um, might know more than James Ernest about the sets, but that's totally fine. Cause he was, you know, he was the original, you know, creator of a lot of the stuff. So I do find that really interesting, but, and I did find, no, I, I found through the, some of the spreadsheets Wolf sent me, um, I did find different versions of different sets. And I could see, going from spreadsheet to spreadsheet, I did see some little edits and things like that throughout. But I did see, I saw mostly spreadsheets, like Excel documents and stuff like that. It was kind of fun, because a lot of them say, like, the 2003 version. So I was, like, I was like loading them last year, um, the newer version. And then... They did switch. I think I had mostly PDFs for the final set, Savage Shores, but that was from 2008. So maybe it was yeah. a mix of different documents they collected. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it got it got real confusing toward the end. <laughs> yep. Um, I mean, WizKids went through a lot of stuff, and it was hard to keep track of who was still doing what at the company, I'll be honest. So uh, I don't think I could put together that, that list yep. uh, at the moment, even yep. if I tried. So uh -huh. what he gave you is more than anyone else has. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It was a ton of stuff without a doubt. So, um, and I made sure to release it so people can look at it too. I just made the master spreadsheet so I could, uh, put all the unreleased stuff I found in those original spreadsheets into an extra sheet at the end, which is really fun to look at. And that kind of gets back to one of my points here that I talked about James Ernest. I think, um, I do wish forts were in the original set. It's funny because, they got removed, but then the Windjammer is a three-masted pirate ship that gets, she's basically immune to forts, but there's no forts in Spanish Main. So it was kind of a funny little preview of Crimson Coast, the second set, which is when they finally yeah. did introduce the forts. But I think it would have been fitting if it Dutch broke, and the forts here, were in the first the way, set. Here's the way to look at uh, Crimson. Um, too much stuff. For Pirates of the Spanish Main. Mm -hmm. And so they made decisions, um, I good ones, I presume, I, I don't I don't know, on what they had to save for the second set, and they moved a lot of my stuff into the second set. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. So uh, yeah, so I don't I don't actually my version actually isn't a spreadsheet of Pirates of the Spanish Main. It's a spreadsheet of Pirates of the Spanish Main and some stuff that would come after. Yep. That makes sense. Right, because so much of it got moved. Um, you know, uh, I at this point, um, I, I look at it, and uh, I don't actually know how when they made the decision to remove the Dutch. You know, it must have caused 
so much work on their back end to re- rebuild my spreadsheet essentially into the new version that and that's as far as I know all Ethan and uh and you know it all worked out obviously but but you know it's it's hard work that's yeah. that's real hard work yep uh, so so yeah it, it's pretty cool nice do you happen to have the original formula um for the ships and crew point costs things like that oh yeah okay it's all in this okay cool all right, good to know. I don't know how I don't know how much it reflects yeah, what the exact mean? outcome of the of, of the final version. Yep. Uh, but I mean, like I said, there's a there's a couple of pages here that are all sort of built out of the principle, um, you know, let me teach you how a ship is made. Uh, and you know, it talks about like of, of what you have to what what you have to produce and what what knobs you can turn on those variants um to get to the point and i i'm you know this is where i'm just guessing uh because i don't remember i'm guessing that james turned over to me a a, a less involved version of this spreadsheet and then i made a more involved version of the spreadsheet and i don't remember to be honest uh, the process and James, James and I have a thing that we say about each other, uh, that, uh, I think it's really true, which is that, uh, we like working together because each of us feels the other one does more than half the work. Yep. That's cool. And so, so, you know, I can't imagine that he would have enjoyed building this giant spreadsheet by himself. I would have done it and I think he would have done a good job on it, but it's not where his passion was going to lie. Um, but at the same time, I didn't really have to worry about the rules. Like I would say, James, this rule doesn't work. Here's my suggestion. And he would go off and fix it. Right. And that's it. Like I didn't have to get deep into the core of the rules because I knew they were in good hands. And I think that was true about, the ships as well, you know, in the flavor text, because, you know, James knew I had it covered. Uh, and then when it got to whiz kids, it went through all sorts of development and, you know, some of it changed and so forth. And, you know, I mean, the thing about the formula, right, is it's just a formula. And so you can vary from it whenever you want. And, uh, you just have to know the consequences of that. So if something seems out of whack, it probably is. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, that reminds me of some of the overpowered pieces, especially in the later, some of the later sets and middle sets got kind of wacky there. Well, I have, <laughs> yeah, I have no belief whatsoever that uh, this spreadsheet ever made its way to the later design parts. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Which, that makes sense. You know, at some point, at some point, they were designing based on previous sets. Mm-hmm. They were looking at, okay, I need to make a ship that has four masts and you know and so forth. What is the ship from the previous set that has four masts and does what I want it to do? Say, I'm just going to copy that yeah. and then modify it somewhat, and then, you know, that just leads to losing uh, perspective on what you have created over time if you don't refer back to the original documents. Now I don't know because I wasn't I wasn't doing that by then. I was off on totally different projects. Yeah, yeah, I think they did that to some extent. That's one of the ways I've been able to make a lot of custom game pieces, which has been one of my passions with this game, making my own sets and whatnot, some historical, some fantasy. But I think they did eventually lose sight of some of the originals because they had basically a reverse power creep where the set quality declined in terms of gameplay over the years to the point where a lot of the ships from Fire and Steel, the second to last set released, aren't even playable with the first like six sets, which are pretty much the best sets in almost everybody's opinion. So it was interesting talking to James about that because he was, he made the good point about how a lot of games have power creep where stuff gets better. So then you can phase out the old stuff and keep people buying. But for a collectible game, the reverse power creep is like a death sentence because there's no reason to, to buy the new stuff if it's not going to be competitive. So yeah, there's there's a couple of things you have to worry about there. The first is, if you make everything great out of the gate, 
then you might not get people to buy your next sets because they're having a good time. Yep. And that's one of the things you just can't have. You can't have people constantly having a good time with what you made because then they won't buy the next thing you make. That's a very cynical way to look at it. And of course we don't really think that way. Uh, No one actually thinks that way, but at the same time, you know, you got to leave space open for new stuff. Otherwise you don't, people won't buy it. Now let's be very clear about something. When we designed this, we did not leave 13 sets of space open. Yeah, exactly. Any idea that the game would be, expanded to the point that it was so the designers of later sets had to find more and more things that they could do in spaces that did not exist in our original design uh did not even necessarily even work in our original design and so it just gets very difficult to constantly do that i mean i have that experience now where we're uh now um, six years into Pathfinder Venture Card Game, and we're constantly struggling to think up new things to do, but we do because we have a great team working on it. But it's, you know, it's like, okay, did we do that idea? If so, how did we do it? Uh, Just comes up all the time, and I have to keep all of that in my head. Like, we have all the cards and stuff like that, but I have to be the one who says, you know, go back and look at uh, Wrath of the Righteous um, uh, set four because we did a card like the one you're trying to do, and uh, and that's that's really hard work. It takes a big team and a really deep institutional knowledge base. And as we said, Wizkids was going through some stuff uh, at you know at the time that we're talking about. So the fact that they could focus at all is surprising. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I don't want to trivialize what they did. They extended a card game, uh, uh, you know, years beyond what it would have done if it had just had the limited vision that we brought to it. So I, I'm very happy that they did it. Yeah. Yeah, same here. Yeah, it was great. And I'll, a lot of the lawyer sets are still interesting. There's just better gameplay quality in the first, like, five or six sets. After that, it started to decline a bit. But anyway... Um, and on that point with the formula, um, Kyle Wolfel, as far as I know, WizKids never reached out to him about um, releasing the Return to Savage Shores. Um, that, that was back in 2012. So that was only four years after it went out of print. So I don't think you would get any kind of issue um, releasing the formula or anything like that. But like you said, it's uh, it's probably changed anyway. So I wouldn't want to, you know. It's no like I said, it that's not. That- nor, that's just not a decision I would make on my own. Yeah, no, that's um, totally understandable. This stuff, stuff developed under contract, I could go back to the people and say, yep. there's some interest out there. Do you want this out? We'll see if it happens. But but let's not presume that it's going to. Oh, exactly. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. Um, the next one, uh, do you think it was a good idea for, for WizKids to dive more into the fantasy concepts, or do you think they should have kept oh, the game more historical in the later sense? Great question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, as one of the original designers, it's very tempting to say, you know, we had a plan for this game. You know, why are, why are you diverting from it? Uh, and I, I think it's just foolish to have that attitude. Uh, at some point, isn't any more source material for what you're trying to do? You know, the, the the Viking longships, you know, did not sail at the same time not as the uh, as you know as 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 the Dutch you know as the privateers, right? And yeah. so so you're gonna have to do something yeah. to to get out of that box. Otherwise you're just not gonna have anything else to write. Like, yeah, they could have come up with more versions of the same thing, but but yeah, no, I, I can't say that it's a bad idea. You got to do something different. Now, you know, if they had said, uh, so they released another game called Rocket Men. Yep. Right? Which was a, uh, and if they'd said, well, we're merging those two lines, there's going to be spaceships, I would have probably drawn the line there, right? <laughs> I would, have, what, would not have been okay with that. But, you know, <laughs> sea monsters and, and uh, you know, uh, whatever, it's all fine. It's all fine. If you don't like it, just play the first sets. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, sometimes that's what I've done. Yeah, 
yeah, I've done some historical based games and things like that. One thing I find fascinating about the historical angle that was talked about on miniature training a while back when I think it was Kelly Bonilla Bonilla that said that they wouldn't do many historical concepts is that although there is pretty much an endless amount of historical content to delve into, and that's what I'm doing with one of my custom sets, part of the problem is you get into potential ancestors who want a piece of the pie or or they just don't want you know their families talked about in a game or something so you know we are talking about pi- we, we are talking about criminals exactly fundamentally yeah, yeah. <laughs> right like pirates are criminals yeah. and so yeah uh, that's that's interesting uh i just never wanted it to be real people interesting I wanted that I mean, I never, because I just wanted to tell our own story. That's fair. Uh, so, so uh, I thought that the fun way to do it was just to imagine a, you know, a totally scrubbed of all of the real troubling elements of piracy. You know, just take all of that out, whitewash it, and just imagine what it would be like if everybody was, you know, very serious about this, but you know, uh, just out there to 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 have a good time on the Pisces, right? And so, and none of that exists. Like, if you look back at a, a real history of piracy, you yeah. know what what you get is actually uh, one of the most depressing, yeah, sets of stories you could come up with, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, Nobody really. wants that in a game. <laughs> yeah. yeah, nobody wants that in a game. Nobody wants. To... Look, fundamentally. If I tell you, I hope you enjoy my new game about slavery. Yeah. Let's <laughs> say, yeah, that, that sounds good. Let's play that. <laughs> right? So we just ignore that aspect of, of piracy entirely. Mm-hmm. Right? Because, because once we get into it, it gets really ugly fast. Yeah, I agree. You know, they're, they're, and also, you know, there are a lot more um, characters of color uh, women in positions of power and stuff like that, that, you know, if you, you understood the history of women in piracy, it's real bad. But, uh, you know, if you make it up, you can get, you know, whatever Jenny and, uh, you know, Jenny's red gunners and, and, and the Calico cat and all that. And it's just, uh, it sounds, sounds awesome. I want to be there. Yeah. But you don't really. And so, uh, <laughs> yeah. so, I didn't really feel a need to make it, but there was every now and then, like there would be like references to Francis Drake and stuff like that. Just yeah. to say we're in the real world. We're just made a new version of the real world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. I do like the historical side, but it does make it more serious and it gets, it gets kind of more towards like a war gaming aspect than a, you know, a collectible tabletop game that was simple to begin with and then got more complicated as it went on. And I was glad they did release some historical characters later on. Um, they did Blackbeard and some others in a Fire and Steel historical pack. And then they did do Edward Lowe as a cursed uh, crew character, actually. So, oh, yeah. But he was totally, yeah, he was one yeah, of the most um, old pirates. Like if, that's, almost, that's almost fiction anyway. Some of it, yeah. Right. I mean, like, Blackbeard, the actual person, and Blackbeard, the legend, are yeah, they're really different. different things. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, if they'd released a card called Edward Teach, and it was just like you know the Edward Teach that was actually a the pirate in question, it wouldn't be as exciting. So yeah, I think you have to do some of that. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean it's it's more fun to just make stuff up. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I've actually I started in terms of custom pieces. I started doing historical stuff, and over the past year, I've actually been shocked by how many fantasy pieces I've come up with my fantasy custom set just reach around a thousand total game pieces that kind of gives an idea it kind of proves your point of how you know coming up with your own stuff can be a ton of fun as well so absolutely all right so the next one is uh do you recall any sets or plans or potential directions WizKids had in the works and did you get the sense that WizKids was fine with the game being one and done with no expansions Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, that's really <laughs> funny, right? I mean, like, like, uh, believe me, I was um, <laughs> in the sense that that's what we thought was going to happen, right? Yeah. Actually, we thought it might be zero and done, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Like that seemed much more likely. If you told me that there were two possible outcomes, 
13 expansions or zero base sets, I would have picked, it was vastly more likely that there will be zero cards coming out for this game. <laughs> um, we, there, there were, there were all sorts of, uh, you know, market issues and, and production issues and, you know, uh, disagreements between wizards and whiz kids and, you know, all, all sorts of things, right. Uh-huh. That could have meant that the thing didn't come out at all. And so I thought we were going to make one set, uh, of that. And then maybe a year later, make a follow-up set and that would be it Uh that's what i thought was going to happen uh and i don't remember anyone in the process predicting this game would be super successful i remember you know just saying yeah let's give this a try and see what happens wow yeah that's really interesting and that does corroborate with some of the stuff i've heard in the past as well they had no plans basically that is that's fun. Oh, I don't remember it. Certainly nobody ever like we had a contract that said when you make an expansion, you give us money. Like that was the thing that happened, right? Yep. And we evaluated that that contract and imagined that we might make a very small amount of money off that. But it didn't happen that way. It was great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So the next one. Did you ever play or have involvement with the SOE, which is Sony Online Entertainment digital version? This was something that came out, I want to say, 2006 yeah. or so. Okay, interesting. I mean, no, I didn't. I didn't have any involvement in it. I yeah. uh, did play it, but I did not actually help make it in any way. With the exception that there were a whole bunch of questions around it and what you could do with the game in a digital context, and I do remember answering some of them. But uh, no, I have almost no involvement in it. Uh, I uh, I don't know really uh, uh, how that game was made. I don't really know who the people were involved with, except I did did know some of them, and uh, and we talked occasionally, but nice. but not in any meaningful way. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Did you happen to play against uh, anyone named Red Dragon or Captain Ron? If you remember. No. Okay. All Should right. I? Just out of curiosity. Yeah. <laughs> is, is that somebody who remembers? I played that game with a thousand people. Okay. So nice. that's <laughs> if, awesome. that, if that's somebody who's saying, you remember the one time when we were here? <laughs> the answer is no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I apologize for that. Oh, no, it's fine. Yeah, no, it's just that they did a, they did like a, a Pirate CSG online radio show, they called it back in like 2008, 2009. Um, based on the online SOE version of the game, and they were two of the more prominent players back then. But it may have been after you had played it or whatever. So yeah, yeah. no, I, I, that, that's 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 beyond me. Yeah. I apologize. No, it's no, it's absolutely fine. It's totally things don't coincide all the time. So, and I I was too late for that. I got in the game in two thousand five, basically. But then I wasn't. I didn't discover anything online in terms of the game in like late twenty ten, early twenty eleven. So I totally missed out on the on the online version, unfortunately. Nowadays, we do have the Vassal module we can play virtually with, but anyway. The next one is, do you remember a favorite game piece you worked on? Oh, um, yeah, let's see. Um, I remember making the... I sure hope this is the actual name of it. I don't remember. Uh, there's a ship called the, in my spreadsheet, called the Titan. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I remember just saying, all right, what happens if I push all of this to the point where a player might choose to make an entire army out of nothing but this ship? Is that even a thinkable thing? (laughs) And so I did that. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Right. Uh, And I think the, 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 I, I remember it specifically because there's a, column uh in the spreadsheet called value pt which is just how we track how much a ship is worth um and all the others have a numerical value in it uh and this one just has uh five uh, number signs <laughs> it was just it was just that that broken uh it got so big that it, it got over the value so i think its value is something like uh you know, uh, like 13 
out of the, um, out of the, uh, you know, whatever, um, 15 points that you got to work, 30 points that you got to work with. Right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, like you could take that and the Algernon and nothing else. Nice. And that was it. Yep. Right. Uh, and so, um, uh, but, uh, yeah, so I remember that. I remember, um, you know, some of the crew was fun. Uh, the guns were particularly enjoyable to make the grenadiers. Um, uh, most of, I, you know, the damn thing is that my, a lot of my favorite stuff is in the Dutch set, oh, okay. uh, which obviously didn't see print. Um, but that's because I was trying to build something. I think it's James's idea, but I was trying to build a faction that could work uh, differently than everything else. Uh, and that might've just been, it might've just been too weird for whiz kids to, to see it. But, you know, um, I think the slags art in that thing is even bigger, is even more valuable than the, um, not bigger, but more valuable than the, uh, Titan was, even though it would, uh, didn't have the same statistics, uh, it's it's move was stronger mm-hmm. than it, it would always outrun the Titan. Yep. And so it was basically the best ship, but what if, what if it was faster than everything else? Right. So it was, it was off the charts. Yeah. Um, anyway, those are some of them. Nice. Yeah. HMS Titan is one of the best ships in the game, basically. Yeah. She ended up being 17 points and she's one of the best English gunships. <laughs> Yeah. 17 points yeah <laughs> well yeah <laughs> it's like, it's like, yeah uh no i mean i knew it right i was yeah. just like what happens if i turn all of these knobs all the way to the right <laughs> and uh and sure enough as long as you can get it to where you want it to go it's the best ship to have yep <laughs> i just cannot guarantee you that that will occur yeah yeah, it is. Yeah, it's like maxed out cannons pretty much and high cargo yeah. ability, stuff like yep. that. Yeah, she stood the test of time really well, even though there were a lot of other good large ships yet, that came along later. She's still one of the absolute best ships ever released. So, absolutely. And if I remember right, she was also totally unsinkable, right? So, not, uh, not quite, but still, you know, like just, one of the best. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, it's in funny. my spreadsheet, she's listed as unsinkable. Okay, yeah. Every, every, uh, Every ability name, every ability has a name in my spreadsheet, and I believe that one was just unsinkable. <laughs> nice. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So anyway, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's yeah funny I mean, you, say, you know, I, so, it's funny you say that because uh, there was a Spanish five master actually, El Acorazado, which means the battleship in Spanish. Corazado, yeah. It's just absolutely crazy. Oh, that's that's pretty much the best like one for one gunship in the game, along with a few others like the Constitution and uh, the Endeavor. But yeah, the the Acorazado was just an absolute beast. So, yeah, there were really yeah. good five masters. So um, I think the I think I made the El Corazado the same level as I I made, even though it's different. I think it's the same uh, same cost in my spreadsheet as the the Titan. But um, yeah. the uh, the thing about um, so the other thing is uh, all of the uh, cards in my um, spreadsheet have a translation of their names right so uh for a while when we were playtesting no one could remember that you know la luz de la luna was the moonlight or whatever you know so they they would just call them by the names you know their english names and it wasn't anywhere near as fun so so people just uh eventually just had to get used to just seeing the spanish names yeah yeah sometimes i look up the names to determine what it what they are and things like that what they mean um yeah that's that's why that's why there is no dutch faction i think yeah it's in some sense right because because there's just no way you can remember what any of those words mean yeah if you don't know dutch which I don't. It's yeah. important to understand that when I put it together, I certainly didn't know Dutch then, and I don't know it now. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, I've designed a bunch of historical customs for the Dutch, and and same here. I don't know how to pronounce them, so I'm playing like the Caribbean game, and I don't even know what to say. I'm just like, um, I don't know if I'll pronounce this or yeah. not, so just whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. 
One thing uh, James Ernest said, he said that they, WizKids, inserted a couple ships after the fact, and they turned out to be kind of the overpowered ones. I don't know if you remember the Dark Hawk 2 at all, or Dark Hawk the second. Um, I, wrote the, I wrote the Dark Hawk 2. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Um, I don't, let me see. So the Dark Hawk 2 was um, Black, uh, what was his name? Blackfoot Bill? Something like that? I can't remember the character's name. That was the original one. It. Yeah, because I in the spreadsheets yeah. that Wolf sent me, I did they, find that it got changed um, to another crew yeah, or no doubt. character. Yeah, what it became. But but anyway, uh, yeah, I had the whole. I had several cards that were about the lineage of the Dark Hawk. Um. So I, uh, James, James and I would not do well uh, to try to remember everything about what happened in that. But I, I remember writing the dark Hawk too. Um, I just think it came out a little different. Okay, yeah. We probably turned it over. Yeah. yeah um, it, it, I just, it, you know, I mean, you can't, you can't get too obsessed about that kind of stuff. I mean, yeah, it, exactly. there's going to be, there's going to be overpowered cards in every game that you put out and people are going to find them and exploit them. And that's fine. Yep. Yeah, it's pretty much inevitable. So, and they didn't play test the later sets as much as the first handful because you got a bunch of pieces that were mediocre, and then you would have like five to ten in a set that were competitive and really good, and just blew the others out of the water. So, yeah, the Dark Hawk ended up being like ten points, but then it had eight cargo, so you can transport like a ton of gold with it with crew aboard all at once. So it's become like one of the best ships in the game. Not quite the best, but one of the best ever. So, yeah, the um. It, I believe it slows down at capacity or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's got a negative ability. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's right. So, and it's probable that um, that negative ability was under was overvalued exactly. in the cost. Yep. Um, and that happens. Like I said, a lot of this stuff when we're making it, you know, we we test it as much as we can, obviously, but it's yep. all about combinations. Yeah. Exactly. And. Uh, one of the things I've learned as a game designer of collectible games is that, that I can't possibly come up with all the combinations that, and so, you know, my approach has always been, you know, play a thing. If you find something that's an exploit, you have two choices. You can either continue to exploit it, which means, and you're having fun doing that. Great. And if you think, Oh man, this is exploiting. I'm not having fun. Forget that card exists. Yep. Yeah, speaking of ideas, there's a ton of different ideas people have submitted over the years. At Miniature Trading alone, there's um, we just got to 1,500 fleets. So there's 1,500 different fleets of various sizes and types and things like that. Not just 30 Crazy. or 40 points, but, you know, 100, 150 points, all sorts of Oh, I've seen points. those games. Yeah, yeah, those games blow me away. So I'm, I'm going to tell you something, and it's probably not... Something James wants to hear, but but uh, I don't remember ever playing any 150 point playtest games. So if the game breaks at that level, yep. I don't feel too responsible for it. That's totally fair. Yep. Yeah, I actually love. That's one of my favorite things about the game is that you can make the build total whatever you want. So like the most I've done is 500 yeah. points <laughs> with five fleets. So it was like 2,500 points on the ocean at once, which is crazy oh. to, compared to the original you know, 30 or 40 point build total. So, but I think that's one of that's, the coolest things about yeah. it, that it's so customizable. And that's what other people have talked about too. It's such an open world and an open game that you can customize it to your liking, which is really fun because you're not limited to like 30 yeah, I think or 40 points. There's in the game that, that I remember that basically say things like, you don't have to put this crew with that ship it just might work better if you do like there's a lot of sort of wishy-washy statements in that rule book that are just like, I don't know, man, go nuts. Mm -hmm. yep. Right. You know, some, some variation on that or some other books, you know, you play is like, look, look, this is how you do this, you know, whatever. And this game basically went, yeah, we are not sure how, but how you're going to enjoy this. So give it a try in a bunch of different ways and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and getting back to the Dark Hawk too, it's also interesting that WizKids added crew after your design work had stopped that might make 
you know, the Dark Hawk overpowered in hindsight, but when Sp- yeah. Spanish Man first came out, you know, they might not have added the crew that would make it the beast of a ship that it became a year later. So, so that, yeah, it's impossible. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's true about every trading card game, right? Yep. I mean, I, I have designed things where it was fine at the time, but later decisions made it very much not fine. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you just have to live with it. You, you know, there's, there's so I, I mean, I worked on uh, Magic the Gathering some, and you know, their approach is, well, if you don't like it, ban it. You know, pretend it's not there. And my approach on most of my games has been just, you know, what? Every now and then, look, we're human beings, and we can't predict everything that's going to happen. So if you find something, even ne- tell us. If necessary, we will errata it out of existence. So, you know, we'll occasionally... But if you look at all the FAQ entries for the Pathfinder game, you will note that there's a whole lot of entries which are clear stupidity on our part, right? They're just errors, right? But then there are very few entries that are like, that begin, well, we don't really want you to do that. So we decided to make a change. There's only a few because... We think people are smarter than that. We think that if they get to a point where they're not having fun with something, they'll just stop doing whatever it is they're not having fun with, mm-hmm. and they'll move on. Yep. Yeah, that's a good point. And the next one, do you have a favorite ship type? So, for example, like one or two massive ships versus fives, like the Titan, things like that. No, I think um, one of my favorite games growing up was a game called Ogre. Uh-huh. Uh and Ogre was a, a game with a big, giant tank versus a whole bunch of little GEVs, ground effect vehicles, right, uh, that would run around trying to stop it, and they'd get smashed up. And the game was necessary. It was necessary to have both of those things because otherwise one would not seem special. Uh, and to prove that, Steve Jackson Games released a game called GEV, which was just the little GEVs going up against each other. And it wasn't as fun. Yeah. So I think I think the key to a game is to a key to a game like this is to try all the combinations uh and and keep modifying what you do. Um that said, um you will find that a lot of the interesting design space on the game happens in the three masted ships because they're not pushed all the way to the highest usability like the five masted ships are or they're not reduced all the way down in the way the one masted ships tend to be right so the more interesting things tend to happen in that three masted range where there are you know one point ships and 10 point ships Mm-hmm. because the rest of the ship isn't maxing out some element of the game. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And it corresponds with how the game is played, where a lot of times the one masters are not good at fighting at all, so they go and get gold. They're gold runners usually. And the five masters are usually used as gunships. Sometimes they have enough cargo to be hybrid or multi-purpose ships where they have enough cargo to get gold but still room for a captain and houseman to fight as well. But that's exactly right. Like three masters and sometimes four masters are usually the most likely to be hybrid ships where they, they have a combination of roles to play where they've got enough cargo to get some gold, but then they also want to fight as well. So that gray area is, yeah. is one of the more fun things in the game. And trying to figure out ship roles is actually really fun too. Cause there's pretty much endless crew combinations where you could put this crew or that crew, or you could exclude this one, or you could go all out and have a ton of crew, things like that. So that's one of my favorite things, just right. the customizability of it is just endless and awesome. Right. I mean, I think that's the part that matters. Yeah. You know, if you're going through and you're like, okay, I made a bunch of boats. Now I better look around to make sure that I'm making the right decisions for whether or not I will win. Uh, and it turns out that sometimes, you know, the, 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 whatever, seven or eight base crew types are actually the way to go, yep. um, over the things that cause 
you know, cost more money. Exactly. Um, because, you know, you're just not getting, you're not getting the bang that you need. You're getting situational bang, right? It's like, if this happens, then this eight point crew I just took is a great idea, mm-hmm. but it might not. And so am I really willing to sacrifice the ability to, you know, get that extra cannon or get that, you know, um, uh, repair ability or, or whatever else, right. Which is just easy to come by. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's complicated and that's what makes it fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly. And the Lord knows what you do with. <laughs> yeah. That, that's I don't know what it's like with 14 expansions. Like, I mean, at that point, I don't know what you do. No, that's right. <laughs> like it's like, funny because you're still you're still absolutely right because it's it stood the test of time because the three point captain and the two point helmsman from back in the day are still the most important crew. Those are the essentials, and then they added right. a lot of gimmicky crew later on that are you know the named crew that cost oh, yeah. like six points or more, and a lot of times they're not worth taking. Sometimes they are, but in smaller games that most people play, like you know thirty to one hundred points in that range, a lot of times you're totally fine just doing the essentials and not doing money of the expensive name crew. So you're still absolutely right about that, actually, even with all the sets. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's, it's important uh, to know that, that we're, we're making things, you know, when we make a trading card game like this, um, we're just trying to explore all the solution space that we can come up with. Right. We're trying to come up with things that maybe trip your trigger. If you like the kind of thing that we're putting out, try it and see if it nails it. And then we're sort of guessing. I mean, there's obviously formulas and all that, but we're, we're guessing what its real value is. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's no guarantee you're ever going to be right about that. You've got a lot of experience and a lot of mathematics behind it, but won't know until long after the set is released what people will actually want to do with it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can't really predict how the players will respond to each set that's released. And of course, what kind of power gamer, to quote James Ernest, what kind of power gamer ideas that they might unleash once they start doing all the crew combos. Because I think there's over a thousand unique ships, and then there's hundreds and hundreds of crew. So there's bound to be some things that slip through the gaps. And I mean, like I said, those later sets, which I've never played, I haven't played most of them, um, the, the, they ha- they're they just, you know, trying to come up with new ideas that haven't been tried. And so when you're in that mode of like, we got to come up with something new, you can't properly evaluate its cost uh, because what you're trying to do is something that isn't costed with the rest of the stuff that you've made. Yeah. You're just sort of guessing what you could make, mm-hmm. and that's hard. Yeah, absolutely. So other than the Dutch, what were some of your ideas that never made it into the game, if you can remember oh, any? I, have, I, I wish I wish I could tell you. Uh, I could compare, like, I'd have to compare that spreadsheet that you have with the one I have. Um, all I remember is that uh, I essentially made a soap opera. Nice. Right. Like my whole thing was was everything in this universe is going to depend on everything in this universe, and I know they cut a bunch of that because I mean, at some point it just gets ridiculous, right? Yeah. But um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I'd have to compare a list, um, but yeah, I mean, I just I know that I turned over way more than actually made it to print, so. I'm sure it was great. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It turned out really great. Yeah. Um, what are your favorite? No, I'm memories? talking about the stuff on the cutting room floor. Wait, what was that? Sorry. I was talking about the stuff on the cutting room floor. I'm sure it was great. You oh. know, like, I don't know. Maybe it was oh. cut out because it deserved to be cut out. <laughs> yeah. Well, whatever. Uh, what are your favorite memories of Pirate CSG? Like playing it? Yeah, it could be playing um, it or just in general. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I guess my first sort of really good memory um, was okay. So when James and I started out, we were making lots of games, and uh, uh, 
a particular um particularly good gamma trade show where we had a lot of games come out at once and i just remember all the people sort of flocking to pirates you know seeing what we had come up with and just you know saying this there's nothing like this this is amazing and they weren't saying there's we've never seen z cards before that's not what they were saying what they were saying was you took the idea of a tactical miniatures game and made it totally approachable and uh and i think that that sort of feel of the game was 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 something really special to be a part of um so I, I really enjoyed that. I, uh, you know, I, I've, I certainly played it quite a bit with fans who really liked it, um, and uh, got a lot of positive energy from them. Um, but you know, just what I remember most is that first moment of people seeing it for the first time and just going, "What did you do? <laughs> you know." How did you do that? And I'd go, well, I have James Ernest and Jordan Weissman. I've got a got a pretty good crew here. So, uh, but just being a part of that was was really special. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah, that's awesome to hear about. One, someone commented on my site recently, my Pirate CSG fan site. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of Dreadog. He was one of the community members. And I actually looked it up online, and it's, I see a post on hcrealms.com from March 2004, before the, even the first set, Spanish Main, came out. And it says Pirates of the Spanish Main will include 230 different collectible pieces, which is interesting because it had less than that at the end. So that must have been, he must have oh, been that's referencing. my set. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah it, that, it has to have been. Well, let me Let me check. Hold on, hold on. How much did you say? 230? 230. Yeah, I can send you the link. Here. So, no, no, I'm good. Uh, um, hold on. I'm, I'm using valuable radio time here. Yeah, no, uh, it's, it's real close. Yeah. It's real close to that number in my spreadsheet. Nice. That is cool. So, uh, yeah, uh, somebody was looking at a, obviously looking at a, uh, a manifest of, of something and got you know i don't know i don't know what they got but interesting yeah. but uh but it was not right yeah. <laughs> it was absolutely but there was definitely there were definitely a lot of stuff that was developed in the early stage that didn't see print mm-hmm. um just uh in the course of you know producing a game you have to make cuts mm-hmm. you know i mean the designer wants everything to come out because that's, you know, them bringing their genius to the table. But it's just not always going to happen. And so what you hope does come out is just the really best stuff. Mm-hmm. And I, I think the stuff that came out of that first set was really great. First yeah. two sets, anyway. Yeah, I agree completely. Yeah, it's interesting. That, yeah, this Dreadog commented on my, on my site and talked about how he was, uh, um, he was like an envoy or he was one of the people that was demoing events at stores <laughs> and things like that for the Pirates game. It talked about how the booster packs will retail for three dollars forty nine cents, which eventually it came out with MSRP for three ninety nine. So it was interesting. I also found a poster recently online, a picture of a poster talking about how the original price was going to be three forty nine a pack. And hearing about the presses earlier and the dies and whatnot, it makes you appreciate more what's in each pack because you know two dollars a ship yeah. essentially is really cheap for for the for the shipping and the the mammoth effort involved. So I still love how, uh, how cheap I, you can find the game for. I mean, they made 15 sets, so <laughs> it must have been worth making. Oh, like, yeah. that's the part that blows me away, is that all this effort, both on the design and graphics side, but then all the production and shipping and, and, and all that, uh, still produced a um, profitable game line. Uh, and that's kind of amazing given what you got for four bucks. Yeah. Right. So, uh, I, I'm very impressed by that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. That's one thing that people, you know, think trying to restart the game have to think about in terms of, you know, price per pack nowadays, if you were going to try to do that with a, you know, probably a smaller player base or collectors, um, or it could be bigger, but 
it's it's tough. And I think you'd have to have a lot higher price per pack. And one one reason that people cited as the why the game went out of print was because the the polystyrene format became too cost prohibitive to produce. Somebody actually got like a message from one of the one of the employees at WizKids saying something along those lines back in like 2008 or 2009. So it's interesting to. I could with. not. Deep what were you gonna say? Sorry. There's no way. I'm yeah. oh, sorry. There is. <laughs> I I could not make this game today. There's yeah. no way. Mm -hmm. uh, given the the differences in production cost, tariffs, everything else. Yeah. I I do. I wouldn't know where to start. Mm-hmm. Uh, it would be very, very difficult. I think, I think at the time, you know, we had a much different environment, uh, but I, I, I think it would be easier. But I think now, I don't think anybody can make this game. Yeah, yeah. Wolf has talked about how stickers would, would be one of the main routes, kind of similar to what you said about painting the existing ships. If you could print sets of stickers that you could just tape over, you know, the your existing collection, and then try that as artwork and new new canon ranks and things like that but re remaking you know sets from scratch would be a totally different ball game so I ask this question it's gonna make me sound like a monster <laughs> is 15 sets not good enough oh <laughs> that's a lot of that's a lot of potential ships and captains and yeah. stuff oh yeah <laughs> like you really need more solution space in your brain yeah. for what you would do with new stuff. I mean, like it might be really difficult to yeah. like figure out that, but I think I, yeah, I mean, I do want to see more of it someday in a different form. There's going to be somebody who comes along and says, I know how to make little plastic boats even better than this. Mm -hmm. And it would be awesome to see, uh, the game design uh, go in a new direction uh, with a different a different set of components, I think. But as far as these polystyrene ones, I don't think anybody's going to ever make that kind of game again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing that I've been looking into lately is uh, 3D printing, which is a really intriguing thing that's going to, you know, should hopefully continue to get better and more practical and less expensive over time. But you get into issues with... Uh, you know, the pirate masks are removable, which is one of the coolest piece, parts of the game you can remove to show the damage. So if you couldn't remove the masks in like a static 3D model, you know, we're going to have to wait a while for probably, at least probably for 3D printing to get to the point where you could get comparable models, you know, with a 3D printer that anybody could own. But I think it is one of the more interesting, intriguing ways the game could be maybe not you know, released in a corporate environment, but at least people could make their own stuff at home in the future with something like that. Yeah, I'd love to see it. Yeah. Yeah, we can, if you wanted, um, we can stop now. I just want to be, be respectful of your time. We could totally stop or continue another time or just continue now. I'm, I'm cool either way. I mean, if you, have more if you have more questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, awesome. All right, cool. Um, how did you get out of Pirates? Other than the contract. Why did I stop working? Yeah. Stop working on it because they didn't need us anymore. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Like right. they said, so I, I mean, I don't like telling stories out of school, but basically uh, we had a contract that said we got money if we worked on a set or we got money if we didn't work on a set. Yep. And we were like, wait, you mean we don't have to do anything and they still give us money? We'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and they had plenty of good people that were making stuff that were just as good as we would make. Yeah. And they were at least at the beginning following my approach of how to make it. So, uh, no, I just, we, we were like, you guys got this great. We're going to go make Gloria Mundy and Lords of Vegas and, and, uh, unspeakable words and, and, uh, all the other games that we made. Right. And so uh, um, that was a really fruitful time for us. And the idea of spending all of our time working on a collectible game and all of its expansions didn't appeal to us at the time. Yeah. Now I would make a very different approach. Now I have a team uh, at Lone Shark that, um, you know, has seven game designers on it. So I would be looking for ways to keep them focused on extending the life of a particular product line. We were a very different company then. We were just basically me and James 
you know, kicking around ideas. And so we needed all the, uh, the time and space we could, we could somehow get. Yep. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Uh, the next one kind of similar to an earlier question, but are there any things you would change in hindsight? Not so much stuff that didn't make it in, but maybe things you would have changed, oh, yeah. um, since then. Hindsight's 2020. Well, I don't remember exactly. I, I don't remember liking the boarding mechanic. Okay. Interesting. I don't remember what I didn't like about the boarding mechanic. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> all I remember is that like there were a few elements that got changed in in the build out that uh, uh, I remember boarding being or maybe it was ramming. Maybe it was ramming. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, anyway, it's so far my memory of what we wanted to do and didn't succeed at is almost non-existent yeah. at this point. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, no, nah, it's a tight little game. I, I, I like everything about it. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. The ramming. Um, one thing I've thought about is how, if you succeeded a ram, it eliminates a mass, which seems historically not as accurate. And then some people have had issues with the boarding mechanic and think it should be more powerful because pirates back in the day would just use fear tactics and they would board and capture a ship sometimes without, you know, firing a shot. Whereas in pirate CSG, you have to basically make the enemy ship a derelict before you can even capture it, which is a, which is a big change. So that sounds, sounds familiar. What you are saying sounds very familiar to me. Yep. Like <laughs> that I might've had this conversation in 2003. Nice. Um, uh, and I do remember that boarding and ramming were were things that that uh, went through significant changes, and and I might not have liked the way they turned out. Mm-hmm. But it is uh, there's a lot of it that is water under the bridge at this yeah. point because I just don't remember. I don't remember what we wanted to happen or what we had better ideas on or whatever. I do remember that people really liked the game at release, and that made us all very happy. Yep, that's awesome. All right, so the next, this last section is kind of a lot of more kind of grand or philosophical questions. The first one, um, where did it all go wrong with pirates? That's not a reasonable question. <laughs> yeah, <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> well, the minute I stop work, no, I have no idea. Yeah, no, I don't think it's reasonable for a game for people to look and say, well, it only had 15 expansions. Yeah. Like that's not a thing that nobody says that about a game. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I think it went wrong when WizKids ran out of money and stopped being able to pay its staff. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No. That's right. Fine. Like, I mean, <laughs> like it's not a philosophical question. It's a it's a situation where the game was expensive to produce and they didn't have the money to make it anymore and they went out of business. Yep. So that's where it went all wrong. Yeah. And if that hadn't happened, then maybe we'd still, you know, maybe we'd be saying, well, I don't know, expansion 45 was a little overpowered, right? I mean, yeah. like, sure, maybe that's what we'd, we'd be yeah. saying. But really, would we? Like, we would be really still talking about this game uh, in new content for this game, uh, you know, uh, uh, 16 years after its base set released. Like, I don't know. Is that really a thing you could ever expect? Yeah. I mean, it's happened with me. It's happened with me a few times, right? I mean, obviously, uh, Pokemon's still going. Magic's still going. Dungeons and Dragons is still going. But yeah. the, all of those games have gone through pretty radical changes over time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just something we've wondered about in the community. Um, mostly in terms of the reverse power creep, because we wonder, just, we've kind of wondered if the reverse power creep and some of the declining set quality and even some of the fantasy elements that were introduced kind of led to declining sales, like, after 2006 or 7, but it's all just kind of conjecture at this point. Yeah, the answer is probably. I mean, all of those things are significant departures from the base set and later in the first couple of sets. So Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I can't really ratify it. All I can say is that, um, you know, the, the mid two thousands were a pretty wild time for the gaming industry just in general. And, uh, you know, a lot changed in that period. Uh, and so I think that, um, you know, uh, 
expecting a game like Pirates to remain consistent with all the upheaval that was happening in, in the marketplace it would have been a surprise. Yeah, yeah, that's a so. great point. And yeah, I'm super happy and grateful that they made so many sets in such a short period of time. It's kind of crazy to think, you know, I, did, I didn't... Maybe collect, that would I didn't collect the whole... Maybe set. that was actually the real problem. Yeah, I think... Yeah, maybe that was the real problem. That. Yeah, too many sets too soon. Like, yeah. like instead of... Right, like if, if they'd come out every six months rather than every three months, like maybe it would have been different. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, uh, yeah, Wolf has talked about that a little I, bit. I, that became a problem in the later I, I, It's too. hard for me to say. I wasn't, yeah. I, to be fair, I mean, I wasn't in the building. Uh, at yeah. that point, I was I was focused on other things. And, you know, whiz kids, I had friends over there and we talked all the time, but but I wasn't, you know paying attention to what they were making except as sort of a fan. I mean, they sent copies over, so I got to see what they were doing, but nice. that was it. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. And then I think we know about the next one, your answer to the next one, but what do you think is the biggest reason that Pirate CSG went out of print? Well, I mean, I think, yeah, I think I already have said, yeah. said enough about that. Yeah. The money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what is your? <laughs> Sorry, I don't have a better answer. <laughs> oh no, that's fine. Yeah, no, it makes total sense. Um, what is your opinion on the effect of the 2008 recession and general economics on the game of that time period? Well, that actually was what I was actually sort of getting at. Nice. Right? Was well, that was that that period of time was traumatic? Yeah. For a great many companies, yeah. right? Now I happen to be in a very different situation. My company did great in that period of time because we were a new company. Well, relatively new company, right? We started in 2003, but we didn't really incorporate and, and become a really sort of actual corporation, uh, you know, until about 2005, 2006. And um, what happened with us was um, as a lot of companies – realized they couldn't make everything themselves, they started turning to us to make their games, right? And so um, I think that uh, I think that the 2008 recession, like a lot of people think games are recession-proof because we do usually do pretty well in those periods of times because people are looking for distraction and entertainment and stuff, uh, or they, you know, uh, don't have as many barriers to their free time, which is a terrible, which is a ridiculously positive way to say they might be out of a job. Right. And so, um, but it's, it's brutal on the yeah. corporate side when, you know, you no longer can, print everything you can't keep everything so i mean to expect pirates to have survived that would have been unthinkable yeah um, i agree uh, uh it was a hard expensive game to make and it was fairly inexpensive to to buy and that's a bad combination in the middle of a recession yeah so the 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 housing crisis was was really disruptive it it stopped people from being able to get credit um it stopped people from, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, being able to place large orders with their printers and stuff like that. It had a significant impact on, on companies that were here in the United States that were printing. It was, it was rough everywhere. And so uh, it was a tough time. Um, and so, yeah, I think that was probably the, like, there are lots of reasons you might point at to say, why did pirates go out of print too many sets too soon? Not enough play testing, not, you know, different change in direction, but the company, the country collapsing, yeah. uh, kind of wins over all of those things. Exactly. And thankfully we, we put in a government thereafter that figured it out mm -hmm. and understood what to do with the tarp plan and so forth. And, you know, the industry rebounded, yeah. but there was a nine month period uh, I remember where things, the, the tap just stopped working. The, the point where things we were making got printed stopped for nine solid months where people would say, I know we said we were going to print this. We're not right. And then in April of 2009, everybody went, Oh, right. We're in the games business. We better make some games and everything started up again. Uh, it was crazy. 
it was a it was a strange time. Yeah, that is really interesting. Yeah, two thousand nine was when the NECA bought bought out with kids in the game. Mm-hmm. Interesting. That's right. Um, yeah, I find it interesting you said about um, people buying board games in a recession. But I saw a comment on Board Game Geek that I made a lot of sense to me a number of years ago, where in terms of pirates and other games, when there's a recession, entertainment is like the easiest thing to cut out of a budget. So if you're buying pirates packs mm-hmm. every month and then the economy collapses, mm-hmm. you know you got to cut your games first before you cut you know groceries. So I think it would That's make right. sense. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I think it makes sense in both. Yeah, it likes the, it's a complex thing. When you're selling things that are fairly inexpensive, they tend to survive recessions. Yeah, It's kind of like how when a volcano blows, um, all of the big animals die. Yeah. Right? Uh, and it's not true that the big companies die, but what happens is that they make things that are smaller that people can buy uh, that aren't, you know, and their big stuff tends to, be tamped down for a while and that really happened to us uh and so so yeah but if you look at what happened after that uh and you look at what especially happened in mecca and how they totally turned everything around with whiz kids after that point um it was you know it's the resilience of the game industry you know people who are get into this industry we don't like to leave it Right, we don't want to go and do other things. We want to make games, yeah. Right. And so they figure out how, and that's that's why the game industry came roaring back in 2010 and had the best year it ever had. Nice, yeah, that's awesome. And then that kind of leads into the next question: Do you have any idea how the 2012 shuffling the deck uh, Pirates of the Smash Main card game did in sales, or how it did in general? Those are the first times I've ever heard those words. Okay, interesting. Yeah, they basically did a cart only <laughs> version. <laughs> yeah, they basically did a I'm cart. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, no, it's all good. No, I mean that kind of that kind of proves the point that it didn't do well because like nobody really cared about. It. <laughs> Perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps it didn't even get I, a copy. Didn't even show up at my house. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> uh, that is perhaps surprising, and maybe I'll look into that. Yeah, but <laughs> I've not ever actually heard of that game. Yeah, basically, it was a cards-only version. Um, they basically just reused the Pirates of the Spanish Main property name and some of the character names and turned it into like a card game um, that oh, basically see. nobody really liked very much. It's called Shuffling the Deck, but. You know, a few Pirates players. I actually haven't played it because I just don't have interest in, like, a non simple game. What were you going to say? Sorry. Deck on each. There's a deck on a ship, you see, and you're <laughs> shuffling. No, it's still terrible. <laughs> oh, God. I didn't even think of that. That's it's a good point. terrible. Yeah, it's, it could be no, fun. It's a bad idea bad idea yeah. um, i have never heard of this game i'm sorry i don't i apologize oh no no don't apologize i no, it's fine i think i wish i could get negative apologize for not making the constructible game again but uh it's too bad <laughs> but oh well and the few i haven't played it because i just i i would only have interest in a naval game that's based on the miniatures like the original game because like just a card game just doesn't do it for me and a few of the pirates players in the community did play it back then and it was pretty much all negative reviews like nobody it's just not at all like the original it's not it's not really worth buying essentially so it's too bad but so they have NECA did make an effort to bring it back in some form but it was just so far removed from the original you know miniatures game that it I don't think obviously it just didn't go anywhere at all so yeah and then all right so I'm going to skip the next one about if the game has a chance to come back or not. I actually reached out to Zev Schlesinger, of, uh, formerly of Z-Man Games. He works with, with kids now, and he actually responded um, to my message on Board Game Geek, and he said there was no movement for the game Pirate CSG, and I don't see it happening in the far-off future. He says it's a, it is a licensing thing, I think. So... I, I mean, um, I, I I have had many conversations with with Justin Zaran and Brian Kinsella of WizKids mm-hmm. about all sorts of game properties, uh, and I don't, I just don't see any great desire in their hearts to make a polystyrene game again. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I mean, like that's. I would never. 
you know, want somebody to do something they weren't super excited about. Yeah. With us. Yeah. That's, that's the only thing we do is, is, is we work on things that, that everybody is, is completely jazzed about. Mm-hmm. And if they're not jazzed about it, it's totally cool. Right. We'll do other things. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, I think he was referring to the licensing issue over the CSG name with wizards of the coast from back in the day with how pirates got changed to like pirates pocket models or pirates of the cursed seas. They changed the name of the game away from the constructible strategy game. Cause I guess wizards of the coast had like some claim to that CSG name. Yeah, or the, something. The, what they did is they, they, they did a patent uh, on a game called chop shop challenge. Uh, this happened at, literally right after I left, hmm. um, like three days after I left Wizards. Wow. Uh, and uh, um, no, I mean, I just don't know the details. But as far as I know, they have only used that pat- patent to make sure other people can't make games like this. Huh. Um, but. Uh, it certainly didn't stop whiz kids from making the, uh, pirates game. And so I don't know, uh, it's probably more complicated than I give it credit for. Yeah, that is interesting. So they already had, okay. That's good to know though. Cause that's one of the longstanding kind of semi mysteries in the pirates community. So it's good to shed a little bit sure. more light on that. I mean, yeah, I, I, I know the patent exists. Uh, I know that they had lots of opinions about it. I know I was involved in all their discussions about it, and uh, not always in a positive way. I was yeah. not always happy with that. But um, regardless, uh, that's my guess is that's a long time ago, and oh, yeah. I could not imagine that that is the reason. I could be wrong, but I would be surprised if that is the reason they can't make more of it. Yeah, okay. Okay, that's really good to know. Thanks for that. Um, I don't know. Like I said, it's yeah. really, it's, uh, this is me talking, talking complete air. Yeah, so if Zev yeah. came on your show, he might have totally different reasons. Yeah. I just, like I said, that's, you know, that's 12 years ago. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. No, More than that. That's 14 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yep. It makes sense. Um, so do you think the game could come back as a digital game? If you don't think it could come back as a physical sure. game? Yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah, I, um, we I think it could come back if people wanted to make it. I just yep. don't know who wants to make it. Yep. Interesting. And I don't have interest in going to WizKids and saying, please let me make a digital game, which is, by the way, not a type of game I make. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah. uh, and I'm certainly not calling up manufacturers asking them to punch me some polystyrene. Yeah. So. <laughs> It seems unlikely that I'll be involved if it ever comes back, unless somebody said we really want you to, you know, re envision these characters or whatever, right? Uh-huh. But it, it just seems, it seems like that is, it's, it's not about, you know, whether or not there's hope for it or anything. It just doesn't seem like anybody really has any drive to do it. Huh. Um, but again, that could be, like I said, I've never had the discussion with WizKids that says, how do we make this work? I've had the discussion that's been, so do you guys want to revive pirates? And they've said, uh, no, we don't have anything in the plans now. And I go, okay, what else do you want to talk about? Yeah. 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 That's a good point. Yeah. I've done everything, maybe not everything, but I've done a lot. What I can do as like a super fan of the game. And I've reached out to his kids and NECA on Facebook and stuff. They usually don't respond or they just kind of give a canned response or whatever. So yeah, it's something where I'd love to, get involved with it but it, until you know unless they relinquish the rights somehow it's just hard to make any headway basically so i've thought about like trying to get some kind of legal contact with them to like, get a lawyer and then talk to them through that but i don't know it seems really I, don't know. I just i think i think they're they're obviously uh interested in holding on to the rights to the ability to do something but yeah whether they'll ever do something is just not something. It's just not a conversation that uh, they and I uh, have ever had in any meaningful way. Yeah. That isn't. I don't mean that we've never talked about it, but I just mean that it's never. Yes, yeah, because never they're just not. 
He's yeah. not. They don't seem to be interested in making that specific game again. Yeah. And uh, and it's a shame in the sense that obviously it would be great if there was more of it, but but it's nobody's top priority. Uh, not mine anyway. Yeah. Yeah, and Wolf and other people have talked about how they make a lot of hero clicks and click style games and things like that. So yeah, yeah it's not their not their. They've core. made some really amazing things. Yeah, they've really made some amazing things in the last few years. So if they're not excited about it, that's not going to produce good results. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point too. Yep. Um, so this is getting into the weeds of the legal stuff, but do you happen to know exactly what patent concerns the rights to produce a game like Pirate CSG? Well, I mean, if it's what we're talking about, it's the Chop Shop Challenge one. Okay. I don't even know anything about I'm gonna look that what up. its current status is, but I do know the patent number. So let me see what I find out. Okay. Um, but uh, as I said, that was a uh, complicated situation um, and one that, you know, I can't really talk about in any meaningful way yep. uh, in the sense that, um, you know, I was, uh, I worked on a game, but I also was an employee of Wizards. And so uh, those two things, be knowledgeable about things that I'm sure nobody wants me to actually talk about. Um, but uh, if it's that patent, which it might be, Uh Um, uh, then, um, uh, and if it's still in existence, which it might be, then that might be why, why people, uh, can't make it. Um, but, uh, but again, you know, I don't know enough to talk knowledgeably about it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It does kind of, it is kind of daunting for me to think about how, the patent, if Wizards of the Coast has the patent, then, you know, WizKids or NECA is also involved. There's almost like a three-part thing that would have to be overcome legally, even try to, you know, make the game or try to make a profit off some version of the game that was new or whatever. So, but that's good to know, though, either way. Have you had experience with the patents for other games expiring and being open to anyone reproducing the game? Um, I mean, yes, uh, I have certainly been around patents, patents that have expired. Um, I don't know, like, you know, I'm not an expert in them, but, uh, again, this is just not something that, uh, I have paid any real attention to yep. over the last few years. Cause it's, you know, not my business to be involved in it. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if a patent goes to the abandoned status, um, then there really isn't anything that anyone can do to revive the patent. Huh. Once it gets to abandoned, it just no longer is enforceable in any meaningful way. Okay. As I know... Sorry, I shouldn't say as far as I know. My guess is that the wizard's patent is abandoned. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, yeah, that. I've... I've uh, done, like I said, they're all... Yeah. I've done a little bit of legal research in terms of uh, the patents that WizKids had and things like that, and I've found some stuff, and I've found things that talk about how the patent expires 15 or 20 years or whatever after first being filed. But then Wolf said something about how even if that happens, they might be able to kind of retain the rights to it or something like that. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, I think it's worth looking into. Yeah. But um, you know, I, I, uh, uh, it's so far from my radar at this point. Yeah, it's understandable. I couldn't speak intelligibly about it, even if I wanted to. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's uh, you've already given us good information about the Chop Shop Challenge game, which I had never heard of, actually, so that'll be interesting to look up and whatnot. Awesome. Um, I guess, well, the next one says, if Pirate CSG came back, would you want to return to it? And you said, kind of, depending on... Me, personally? You know, 
Yeah, depending oh, on the circumstances. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I think that, yeah, I mean, I think that's a definite yes. Awesome. Um, that's cool. I'd be surprised if I got asked. Yeah. But, uh, but if I did get asked, uh, absolutely, I would do it. I've had some reasonable uh, successes mm-hmm. with reviving things from the, the past in the last few years. Um, so, for example, we're just producing a, a new version of my book, Puzzlecraft, which was published by Sterling uh, in 2011. And... Uh, I just got the rights back and said, I want to make a new version of it. And we just did. Right. So it's not like when things go out of, and obviously betrayal at house on the hill came back in a big way. Um, so it, I, earlier when I was saying, I just, you know, I don't think it's very likely it's because of realities of how hard I think it is to make a game like this. Yeah. But if somebody broke through those realities and wanted to make it and they asked me to be involved, hell yes, I'd totally do it in a heartbeat. Okay, that's awesome. That sounds really cool. Yeah, I've got your site up with the Puzzlecraft page, actually. So, yeah, very neat. I'm glad to hear that you've been able to revive some stuff, because sometimes I get really nostalgic about some think different things in life, and, you know, it's, it's it's fun to make a comeback. And that's one thing that's that I think would be good if Pirates did restart, is we're to the point now where a lot of the kids who played back, you know, 2004 to 2008, now they're older, and now they have more money. So a lot of people are nostalgic for the game and get back into it with more money than they ever had as a kid. So the nostalgia factor is something that would probably come into play in a decent, you know, to a decent degree if it came back onto the market. I think there would be a decent market for pirates, but like we've talked about, it's just it's just a mostly a matter of keeping, you know, pack prices low somehow. Here's what I know. Here's like what that. I know about nostalgia. Yeah. Here's what I know about nostalgia games. Uh they come back through Kickstarter. Yep. Right. They come back roaring back because people go, oh, my God, I totally love that game. And they throw lots of money at it. What they don't tend to do is come back through the normal method of of making games, except that in 2016, I made and my team made Widow's Walk, the expansion for Betrayal, Mm -hmm. because eventually people kept they kept asking us over and over and over and over again, will you please make more betrayal? And eventually we couldn't say no. Yeah. Right. So I think ruling it out is a mistake, but I think in this particular case, there's some pretty serious obstacles. Yeah. And uh, so people would have to want to get over those obstacles. Yeah. Yeah, I do. But yeah, the legal stuff is just, kind of a big mess really and an expensive one potentially to even try to navigate so yeah i do i am seeing it on your site too and yeah 2004 that's really awesome i love that um okay all right so last few questions what are you doing now you can talk about anything any games you want to promote things like that um yeah certainly so uh well, uh, let's see what's going on. Well, we have uh, a new set of the Pathfinder Adventure card game coming out called the Core Set, uh, and a new uh, Adventure Path called the um, Curse of the Crimson Throne, which comes out in May, uh, and that's going to be great. Um, some of the games we've produced recently: uh, Apocrypha, um, World, and Thornwatch. Uh, still doing good. There, they all came out last year. Um, and they've been, they've been doing great for us. Our new expansions for Apocrypha, the flesh and the devil just came out and they're, they're, they're also real good. Uh, we have, uh, we just did a new, uh, uh, campaign for the maze of games, which is our interactive puzzle novel, which I think is one of the things that we've done that we're most proud of. Uh, it's certainly been the most successful thing we've made. Then, as I mentioned, our new book uh, is called Puzzlecraft. Uh, it's how to make all the kinds of puzzles in the world uh, that I did with Thomas Snyder. Uh, and it's it's super good. It's it's beautiful and, and great. Uh, and then so that's what it, that's what it, that's what Lone Shark is doing on the political side. Uh, I have a little little group called Basket of Adorables. We just made a book uh, called Game Theory in the Age of Chaos, which I wrote, which is available at basketofadorables.com. Um, if people like the idea of me writing about politics, they should they should check that out. 
you don't have to agree with me to uh, to think I'm a, a good political analyst. Um, you do have to think I'm a good anal- political analyst to agree with me. Uh, so, uh, so, um, uh, so that's that's that stuff. Um, but yeah, mostly just uh, making cool games and puzzles, and just trying to uh, keep all our fans happy. Awesome. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I was clicking around your site. I like your site. Clicking around to some of the pages you just mentioned and stuff like that. Um, so beyond LoneSharkGames.com, which I've got right up right now, and I have some links in the YouTube live description, which will also be in the podcast description and posts and whatnot. Um, but just to elaborate, where can people find you online? I'm all over the place. Um, I'm. It's always my name. So it's Mike Selinker on Twitter. I'll respond to anything anybody throws at me. Um, uh, also on Facebook, just Mike Selinker. Happy to become anybody's friend. Um, uh, I got uh, our, our Lone Shark itself uh, has a Twitter page and a, oh, sorry, a Twitter account, LoneSharkGames.com, or just Lone Shark Games, I'm sorry. And uh, also its Facebook page. You can also get on our mailing list, um, uh, our MailChimp, our website. Uh, and there's a sign up page there. Uh, and I'm always at conventions, um, uh, where I go to something like 20 plus conventions a year. And, uh, so I'll be at origins. I'll be at Gen Con. I'll be at PAX West. I'll be at PAX Dev. I'll be at, uh, all of them. So, uh, so yeah. Um, and I always love it when people come up wherever I am and tell me that they like my games. I think that's kind of awesome. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah, I love Pir- Pirates. is my favorite game by far. It's not even remotely close, really. I've been, been so obsessed with it that I don't really play other games really hardly at all. So it's become a, a really awesome time for me over the years. So so thank you for that. <laughs> Absolutely. You're, you're um, most welcome. I mean, obviously, <laughs> uh, I, I, I am very happy to have been involved in the creation of it. Uh, and I'm thrilled that there are still lots of people playing it. Yep. Yeah, same here. Uh, do you have any questions of the day for the audience? It could be about pirates. It could be about anything. It could be about games or or not. If you want to, you can ask. Uh, I'm, I'm, no, I I, I appreciate uh, appreciate the people who are willing to listen to this. Uh, what turned out to be a fairly long uh, <laughs> list of questions that you guys had ans- uh, yeah. me answer, which I'm thrilled to have done. And obviously, um, you know, if you have any questions, just come find me. Uh, online and ask them. I'm always happy to answer, uh, but I really appreciate that people are uh, keeping the flame alive for this thing. And uh, you know, who knows? I guess we shouldn't rule anything out, right? Awesome. Yeah, exactly. That's that's my mindset. I'm kind of cautiously optimistic, and I'm still I'm in my 20s, so I'm thinking like way long term. Even if it doesn't happen soon, you know, I'm thinking way out in terms of a restart. So. Um, I guess well, I'm, I, I'm not. In, I'm not in my twenties. <laughs> <That's laughs> so. Well, one thing. I, one thing so I've been. What is, <laughs> one thing I've been looking into is uh, a lot of the futuristic stuff. There's potential a lot of anti-aging and you know life extension yeah. stuff coming along. So you never know. We might all live to yeah, 150. Sure. So uh, I mean, I uh, hope. <laughs> to the, to, when when pirates when pirates re-releases itself in 2149, I hope I'm there for it. Yes, exactly. Yeah, awesome. Um, so my question of the day, just to just to have one at least, it would be for the audience. Um, do you wish the Dutch were in the original set, Pirates of the Spanish Main? <laughs> and um, if so, would you prefer them to be a major major faction alongside the other three original factions throughout the sets? I know my answer is absolutely yes because I love the. No, my answer stuff, is but... absolutely. My <laughs> answer is absolutely yes too. Um, <laughs> would love to have, would love to have actually made those ships because they were pretty great. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. All right. All right. Thank you so much for coming on. This was Pirates TSG episode number 42. And uh, thank you all for watching and listening. One of the best podcasts. So thanks again and good night. Hey, good night.